but in the meantime, I guess we'll we'll sort of get started here. Um, Jeannie, thank you for coming on, and uh, it's such short notice. I appreciate it. Um, all right, I guess I'll get started. Robin, you should have uh, an invite. I'll try one more time. So um, thank you everybody for listening so far. Sorry for the, uh, the technical difficulties. So my name's Adam. Um, this is what I call a good faith space uh, where every week we have different discussions, different topics, different panel. Um, this week we are discussing um, mental health on social media. Um, and I'm trying to get, uh, Robin, Robin can hear me, but apparently she's not seeing my invite. Um, <laughs> every week we always have some sort of issue. Um, so while, while I'm trying to help Robin, um, I'll let the one person we do have on the panel, Jimmy, you want to introduce yourself. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, first, can everybody hear me pretty clearly? Can I get a 100 if you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Well, I am Jenny Robinson. I am the CEO of GRC Advising. I have a podcast called Uncommon Sense with Jenny Robinson, and I also have a store called The Audacity. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this. I think it's an important topic for us all to discuss, especially with how isolated people have become with the government's tyranny concerning COVID. So I think it's just something that's on everybody's mind, and I think mental health as it relates to social media is just a really important topic. So thanks for having me on, Adam. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, still trying to help Robin here. I don't know if she's having uh, app issues or, or what. But um, to introduce myself for people who aren't familiar with me, my name is Adam Coleman. I'm the author of a book called Black Victim, the Black Victor. Um, it gives um, social commentary while telling my personal story. Um, and I'm also the founder of a, of a website called uh, Bronx Speak Publishing, wrongspeak.net, uh, where it's a free speech type of platform. People can write openly. Uh, so if anybody's interested in writing on there, uh, feel free to contact me through the website. I appreciate it. Um, so we'll get into the topic. Um, Robin says she can hear me. She can get into the room to listen. Uh, she doesn't see our pop-up. So she can hear me. Are you on your cell phone? Because that is the most important part. You have to be on your phone. Um, if for some reason you're on your phone and it doesn't work, close out of the app altogether. Try and go back in and see if it works. But it should work. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the topic, mental health. Um, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of mental health. Um, you know, my book talks a lot about psychology, um, just like basics of psychology. Obviously I'm not a psychologist. Um, that's what Robin's, <laughs> Robin is a therapist. So that's why I, I invited her on. Um, but I have a pretty good understanding of just basic psychology, um, and I, the way I use social media, I'm very observant. I watch how people move. And I notice that there's certain trends that happen, um, whether it's to create outrage through the algorithm, uh, whether it's to exaggerate certain things that are happening in our society. Um, and I, I wonder how, how these different movements are actually affecting people. Um, you know, we we can go towards the you know the social the, the social movement with Black Lives Matter, for example, um, and and George Floyd situation. You know, and taking something that is relatively isolated for that particular you know police department in that situation and growing it into something that people almost had like a I don't know it just felt like a public panic attack uh, for a number of months after it happened. It's the best way I can kind of put it. And I wonder how healthy is that uh, from a mental standpoint to feel like 
you are surrounded uh, by people who are trying to take you out because of your skin color or, um, or believing that the world is incredibly menacing when it's a complicated uh, place to exist in. Um, and I wonder what's the role of social media when it comes to that and the, the, the feeding of the outrage. So uh, I, I definitely wanna get the professional uh, viewpoint from Robin when she gets in here, but Jenny, what do you think about what I was saying there? Are, are there any, is there anything in particular that sticks out to you on social media that, that worries you? Oh, for sure. I agree with you that there are definitely isolated incidences that are blown out of proportion. I think for social credit, honestly, like for social media points, for likes, for, you know, retweets and shares, I think people do that because they want to, one, seem compassionate and like they care about these things. But two, I think it just helps up their brand. I think a lot of people on social media feel the need to be on top of any anything that comes out that anybody says that they think is just this huge thing that happened, and it may be, there may be times where there's a huge thing that happens, but sometimes, you know, and Adam, you've written about this before, where things can happen, but let the people in that area focus on that. That's, that's what they're there for. That's a community. And I think that people are just very quick to find these things and jump on these things because they want, I think, ultimately validation, but it's ironic how it actually ends up, you know, being detrimental to their psyche because they're focusing so much on things that they don't really have an immediate control over. I get that. I understand like the motivation for certain people, but I'm, I'm curious on the, uh, what are the, uh, well, I guess we don't really know what the true long-term effects of, of, uh, you know, social media on the, on the brain, um, or at least social media in the way that we see it today. Um, you know, I remember the old days where everything was basically independent from each other, and, and now everything is centralized to a few networks, like you know, Twitter and Facebook, for example. So we don't really know what the true long-term effects are. We can see the trends. You know, we can look at suicide rates for for young girls, um, and how that's increasing, and basically increasing since social media. Uh, we can look at other kind of disturbing trends, uh, you know, of let's say uh, gender mutilation, for example, uh, to be kind of vague. You know, we can look at all these different things and, you know, maybe we can point at social media, but I'm not a, you know, a social scientist. I don't really know what the true impacts are or the correlation between it. But I'm, I, I would think it's safe to say that it has some relevancy to young people um, and this feeling of uh, needing constant acceptance. Um, you know, a lot of times I go back to family. I think people are more disconnected, even though we have the technology to be artificially connected. And I think there's a general lack of purpose that people are exhibiting. Um, you know, for example, the whole cancel culture thing. I mean, it takes a lot of effort, energy, um, motivation, and a feeling of some, some, some sort of reward at the end to go after someone that you don't know, um, to try and dig up and research things about that person, uh, to harass them, you know, to all these different things. Uh, there's obviously something that they're gaining from it. So what, what kind of life, like I, I think to myself, I, I'm a busy person. I, I, have, I have things, I have, I have a purpose, I, you know, about myself. Uh, I have things to take care of. That, that shows me someone who lacks purpose, who lacks uh, some sort of personal motivation towards anything productive to spend that much time going after someone that they don't even know uh, personally. So, you know, I wonder about all these different things and, and how social media kind of plays into that or if it uh, eggs, on, eggs on people to, to do such a thing, if it encourages it. Um, or is social media just a tool, right? And it just highlights the deficiencies of people that, that they would have had without social media. 
you know, I think that's a that's a valid question. What do you think, Jen? I agree with you. I think that people, you know, we're people. We want a purpose. I think that that makes sense that a lot of people who don't feel a very strong sense of purpose would, you know, go to social media for that immediate validation. I'm not a social scientist either. I'm not a psychologist. I did minor in psychology in college. And I just, I think that we don't, like you said, we don't have the long-term, I guess, science on what it would, will do to people, to their brains. But we do have the short-term results, and it's not, it doesn't look like it's great for people. Um, you talked about how, you know, we seem more connected, but we're actually less connected than ever when it comes to actually knowing people in real life and connecting with them. I think that from a biological standpoint can do a lot of harm um, to have this sense that you are connected with people that you don't even know, like that you don't even know in real life most of the time. And I think that, I mean, the goal seems for me to be, yes, that immediate validation that they are seeking, but I think you're right, Adam, that they are ultimately looking for a greater sense of purpose that they don't feel like they're getting in whatever job they're doing or whatever clubs they're in. So they turn to these things that they see happening in other areas that, again, they don't have immediate control over. But I also do think that it stems from the whole wokeism that we're seeing in our country right now and all over the world where people just want to be seen as compassionate and caring, and maybe it's not for, maybe they don't even care about it as much as they claim to care about it on social media, but they want the illusion that they were paying attention and that they saw this and that they care about it for, I can't figure for anything else other than, you know, points. And points for what? I think probably political points if we're thinking about how polarized everything has become. Um, you know, I think that people want to stay a part of their side. And if, if they see people that they know sharing something, they're going to want to jump on that bandwagon. And it's just, frankly, peer pressure probably most of the time. And we know that peer pressure is, is not good and that you need to, we've been told since we were children, to steer clear of that. So I don't think that, I don't think the long-term effects are going to be very bright if we're looking at the short-term effects, then we can kind of predict that. Um, I just added Malcolm, if you want to add you two cents. All right. Hey, first off, again, how's it going, Jenny? How's it going, Adam? Good to see you guys after our last time, at least in this virtual place. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is actually fairly interesting, and, you know, just kind of getting back into the swinging space. I actually kind of like, like this topic just a little bit more, mainly because it delves into a lot of crucial things about human psychology. First off is the need to belong to something bigger than oneself. And, you know, first we have to look at how does that really take form? Online, it takes form in the, it takes the form of crusading for causes, purposes, championing ideas, and things like that that require a bunch of people to come together and just this massive rallying cry. And when that typically happens, you know, it only happens in one direction. I hate to get very political with this, but it does typically happen in a situation where, you know, we look at like more liberal causes where they really want to reform something. And so typically when you place a moral impetus on reforming something, like you place some kind of moral importance on it, People get highly involved, you know, they get their feelings involved. They start to believe that this is their moment, that this is their time. And anybody that opposes that or, you know, maybe throws a little bit of cold water or just, you know, kind of dampens it a little bit. It elicits a form of, I don't want to say like visceral anger, but it's a certain kind of anger because you're attacking a deeply held idea or convention that somebody has. Now, the thing about the Internet is, that's really funny is that the Internet is cathartic, so to speak. You know, it's supposed to be this place where we can come on, say anything, do anything. You know, repercussions are minimized because, again, we're all just pixels and we're all avatars on the screen. And that's supposed to allow people to let out uh, some emotion, some built-up tension that they might be having in their jobs or, you know, their personal lives. I know Jenny mentioned that these people weren't getting a lot of fulfillment. And I think that's very much true and that's very much correct. What you're starting to see now is that 
again, just being able to say whatever you want on the internet isn't enough for some people. Now we are getting to the point where we're constructing social hierarchies online because we spend so much time online that people are creating these whole alternative lives, these whole platforms, you know, these whole tier systems. And it's just basically becoming an analog for, you know, their actual life. And it's funny because, you know, we talk about the metaverse, but, you know, if you look around, we're already in the metaverse. You know, we're living an entirely different life online and people are attaching value. They're attaching real emotional purpose to those lives. And now once you've gotten to the point where you're desensitized to the catharsis that comes along with saying whatever you want and please online, and now there's a tier system and you're championing a cause and you want to really feel justified, but you're just another faceless cog in the machine, what is there left to do? Clearly, you've got to be outraged. You've got to find an enemy. You've got to find somebody to get a one up on, right? You know, that's we're on Twitter, the most notorious platform for one upsmanship out there. So these people, so, you know, really people get in their minds, okay, I'm going to find a target or I'm just going to get this moral justification for me to unleash whatever pent up feelings that I have in a way that's going to move me up in the social ladder and get, gain me recognition. And that's what you end up seeing, uh, you know, prompting people to attack people online and feel good about it. And another issue that we end up having is that, you know, because people have so much of their identities, their lives and everything else built up into what they've created in this online sphere, you know, now, whenever that is like jeopardized, it's like, it's like facing catastrophe in like real life all over again. So now you get the mental, you know, you get the mental ramifications of a great catastrophe or tragedy befalling somebody and that can really mess with your psyche. When it's like, you know, you found this online escape, you know, this perfect world. And, you know, you've worked so hard to build up this persona that, you know, you can never have. And now it's getting attacked. And that's what happens. You know, it, it, it can happen in a political sphere. It can happen in the beauty community. It can happen in the sports fandom. Anytime, you know, you see people <laughs> every day basically get their whole careers, you know, uh, we we make a joke and there's this whole meme about I'm about to end this man's whole career. But I mean, you know, that's how people really feel when they get attacked and they get one up online. And it really does start to, you know, play into some massive psychological, you know, just some um, cascades. And so that's really uh, that's that's my unrefined take on the matter. But no, this is a great this is a great topic. I think we need to really delve into this. I can't wait for the expert that you guys have. Yeah, we're still trying to get her in here. But in the meantime, uh, Isaiah, what do you have to say? Well, uh, first off, Adam, again, uh, this is a this is a fantastic room that you've put on today. And it it actually and, and here's why this is I have firsthand experience with this uh, uh, with this. I guess we can call it a. Um, a de-evolution of people's mental health. Um, so last month, um, Ben Adam, we've talked about this. I mean, I'm, I'll make it brief for the for the room here. Um, so last month, I uh, last month a tweet went viral. Uh, first time in it, the first time I'd ever gone viral in like 12 years uh, that I've been here on Twitter. Uh, quadrupled my following in like a day, you know, and and I, you know, I, I, I made a statement about the Biden administration and um, someone who I, I actually lost a lot of, uh, uh, of friends and uh, uh, I guess, well, rather I'll call them associates that I had here uh, on Twitter. But there was one in particular uh, who went the next level like she didn't just uh, she didn't just unfollow me. But she decided to push it further. Like she was like she was already trying to bait me into some kind of uh, confrontation. <clears throat> uh, so let's fast forward to uh, to today. Well, I'm sorry, to Monday, where 
I'm on my way to work and this same woman uh, decides that she wants to attack me for a tweet that I wrote three days ago uh, criticizing one of her political idols, uh, uh, Attorney General Tish James. Um, we had we had discussed, I mean, if, if, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Andrew Cuomo resigned back in August and uh, it, a lot of it was due to the fact, a lot of it was because of uh, allegations of sexual assault made by these three white women uh, and the attorney general, Tish James, the attorney general of New York, uh, you know, she said she was going to do an investigation and she did the investigation. She said Cuomo was, you know, was it, it did all this stuff and case basically was case closed. Didn't even give the man, it didn't didn't offer any of the findings, anything like that to Cuomo's counsel. It was a, it was a long Long story short, all of the charges against Cuomo fell apart. And I was warning people about this, specifically this individual who had attacked me. Uh, I had warned her in October about the investigation was starting to go south. Things weren't looking so good. She decided to stay. She decided was like, I'm going to die on the hill. I, I love Tish James. I'm going to support her no matter what. She's black. Why would you listen to these people? They racist, which is always like the first thing that people say. But anyways, over the last 48 hours, I publicly, I said I did not want to do this, but I, I showed, I posted publicly that I had talked to this woman and told her about, the, the, I proved that I had warned her about this investigation. And uh, I guess I must have damaged her uh, emotionally or whatever by, by simply telling the truth because she she has launched, she has been over the last couple of days just going completely crazy. She's accused me of being a creep, a stalker, and all sorts of stuff when all I asked this woman for back in May of last year was a cup of coffee, right? Like just, it's but. The, the the bottom line is, and and the same thing can be said of the K Hive because she's she's a part of the K Hive. Um, there are there are groups of people just like Malcolm said, there are groups of people on this app who have no purpose. They have no purpose. They have no meaning other than being stands for whoever their chosen political heroes are, and. And if you and, and honestly, when you combine that kind of stand culture, okay, and K Hive for those for again for those who don't know, K Hive uh, is a is a group of fans of Kamala Harris. Okay, so when you so when you have these kind of mercenary cultists, I'll call them mercenary cultists who have you know who who are looking for cults to follow. Right, they're they're kind of they're kind of stands for hire, as it were. When you combine that with this, with 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 our already impa with with our already incredible narcissism, our incredible impatience, a lack of civic, a lack of understanding of civics and or the democratic process, you end up with people. You know, you know, you end up with people wanting more authoritarian systems of government and structures. Just because it's expedient, they get whatever they want right here, right now, you know. And I feel like that's. I mean, and again, I'm not a. I'm not a scientist. I just observe things. This is what I'm seeing, and honestly, I will tell you, uh, I am not optimistic about our society, and I'm not optimistic about what uh, social media has wrought for uh, people's mental and emotional health. You yeah. hear. Uh... 100% agree. Wow, that was <laughs> I already know the I already know Isaiah's story and everything. So, um, but I think Isaiah's right. Uh, and thank you for adding uh, to the conversation. Um, you know, there are people who use who uh, use this app for vendettas who who try to find some sort of way to attack people. Um, and you know, I question what do they gain out of it? 
uh, not necessarily like monetarily or, or just, you know, emotionally, but just like mentally, what do you gain from this? Uh, how does this make you feel to try to ruin somebody? Um, so it's, it's that kind of thing uh, that I'm, I'm highly concerned about and I kind of think about, um, and especially in his particular example. Uh, Tickles, Tickles is here. How you doing? Hey, good evening. Sorry I'm late. Got stuck in Houston traffic. I should have expected that. My apologies for the delay. Um, it's all good. This, this topic is, is so deep in, in my heart right now. Um, I've been through this too. And, and I have to agree with the hive as, aspect of people's mentality. Um, I've been told uh, there's a, a little group uh, that circulates around spaces, especially in, um, back in the day when December of 2020, spaces was still in beta. And due to the longevity of my account, uh, Tickle, uh, Tickle gets a lot of invitations from Twitter. Hi, Sarah for all sorts of little things um and so they they gave me spaces as a beta um again now december of 2020 and so i started hosting and of course there were not that many spaces going on at the time so of course it became extremely popular and the majority of we talked about politics and the subjects of the day had a lot of uh, veterans that would join and and would discuss ptsd etc and over time, the app expanded and allowed to have co-hosts, which, of course, with three and 400 people, that became necessary. And, and I would choose them based on what I'd experienced from them. Well, this turned out to cause a lot of problems. A lot of jealousy went down. And I did rotate people, and the spaces became more of a generic uh, offering across Twitter. I invited people to become hosts so they could learn the little bits behind the scenes. Um, you know, how to add people, how to give them a microphone, how to take it away. If you've got trolls, how to not just get them out of the room, but how to block them, how to report, those types of things. There's a few, all sorts of things that goes on behind the scenes with, with being a Spaces host. And um, it became necessary to have a couple. So I offered um, long-term guests as it were to learn the ropes and started rotating people well the first ho first co-host got very annoyed about this and decided to go on a rampage against me um and to the point of where they there was an attempt to dox on me and they actually got the wrong person and they ended up with a 72 year old lady who was uh, on her last days and this was the fall of last year, 2021. And subsequently, sadly, this lady has now passed away. I was able to locate the, the, the individual and her family and got her daughter involved in reporting all of this to the FBI. It was absolutely abhorrent what went down. Um, they, list, they actually put photographs up of this woman's credit report, all sorts of horrible things, horrible things. And I was accused of collecting money for someone that happened to be a very good and personal friend of mine stuck in Afghanistan who was an interpreter, never collected a dime. And that accusation still flies around. And I've asked people many, many times over, well, you know, if you all sent money to a cash app or a Venmo or the like, show me receipts, show anybody receipts, because you'll get them, you have them. But not only that, you can't send cash app Venmo, etc., to Afghanistan. So good luck with that. And it it's, it still trails me. It got thrown at me again a few few weeks ago. And it I have to question. And just today, after all these months, I funnily enough looking at this topic that Adam invited me to uh, a few days ago, I decided to look into someone. And the main accuser um, turns out to have. have just, I finally decided to do some really deep investigations on this and finds out that everything I'm being accused of is what they've done, um, including a couple of bankruptcies, business bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies, all sorts of things, um, which, of course, I'll never make public because that's not my karma and I won't do that. However, it did satiate me a little bit 
to to finally discover this because I've just been brushing it off and brushing it off. But the attacks that come are on, on ordinary everyday people. I don't know if it's founded in jealousy or their own projections from their own behaviors. I can't possibly put my finger on it. I wish I could. But I've this account is nearly eight years old. I have a master account that was opened in March of 2006, the month that Twitter started. So I've seen a lot, seen an awful lot, probably a little bit too much sometimes. And never have I been accused of anything like this. And even to the point of where it was decided I'm not from South Africa, they decided that I'm not even a woman at one point. I was accused of using a voice synthesizer. Um, and, it, and it's still the same group. And it fascinates me that even though a lot of them just got recently purged, nothing to do with me, in what they call the February purge, and then the one late last year, they keep coming back. And it's always the same group over and over and over again. And it doesn't stop. But it, it rotates as to who is the flavor of their assaults. Because right now it's someone else. And... I, I can't help but wonder what is it that's missing in their, not just their lives, but in their emotional capacity to not comprehend fully what they're doing. And had I have been a not so quite strong woman, I don't know what the consequences would have been. Because I am familiar with some suicides over this in adults, not just children of social media, but in adults too. And it, it's that moment where you, you, know, you decide to take the high road or do you become defensive? And I took the high road. And it's now been nearly six months. And of course, you know, the, the truth is floating because the truth always floats. And you know, no, one, no one can ever deny that. You've just got to be patient and sit back and wait for it to happen. And that's the hard part. That's the very hard part, and not letting it affect you in any which way. But that's so difficult to do, and just decide, I'm not going to pay attention to this. I'm not going to invest in it. I'm not going to acquiesce to this. I don't have to prove anything to anyone. Never ask for a penny from anybody. However, again, one of the main players has got you know money requests all over the place for this, that, and the other. And Sahara was somewhat of a witness to some of this. And, you know, it, it, to this day, it goes on. And it's not, not me anymore, per se. I'm not the original, I'm not the, I'm not the dedicated target anymore. It's someone else. And, and I found that person and I've been throwing them my support to help them out and get through this. But I've known lots of people that have just faded away off of social media accounts because of these attacks which come from mentally unbalanced people emotionally unbalanced people and people that are just wrapped up all day 18 20 or more hours a day on six and seven social media accounts just looking for trouble just looking to cause problems for people and it's not just in our youth, it, it's in adults as well, which is beyond disturbing to me. I'm very much what you see, what you hear is what you get. Um, this is it. And yes, I can speak at great length on, on global and geopolitical aspects. I can speak with a good sense of humor as well. And I enjoy people. I, people always ask, why do you follow back so many? Because I want to know what they're saying. I'm interested in people. I believe in relationship Twitter. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what it's called. Social media, not anti-social media. But it's becoming this. And it's deeply disturbing. And it's not just a political divide. Because these are people that claim to be patriots. And I, I developed a new phrase for this as P-A-Y triots. Because they want money. And, and if anyone just takes it on the surface and, and just, you know, says, OK, well, there must be something to this. Otherwise, there, there wouldn't be a group of eight or nine people accusing. Hmm, well, allegiances are formed in all sorts of corruptions. And it, again, it, it, it's that moment where you've got to take a deep breath and say, why are you doing this? What is it that's missing in your life 
that you believe you have to get involved in mine. And and I think that's the salt and pepper of this recipe is to, is to comprehend fully what it is that's missing for them. And that's not my intent to discover because I'm I have no desires or interest to. But it becomes very apparent when people behave like this that there is something definitely, definitely missing. And their their only joy is is misery, which ultimately is their own. And I find that very sad actually. And I believe in loving my enemies because it annoys them. And I used to I used to put little notes out on the on my account that I knew that they were looking at from secret accounts and say, you know, I like to be liked, but I love to be hated. And I, I knew that that would really get them. And it um, it it's it's disturbing. It's disturbing that we have so much out there. And um, and if anyone's experiencing anything like this, uh, please feel free to DM me and. I'll I'll do what I can to show you some support because I believe that we need to be stronger and we're stronger together. All right, thank you for uh, for saying all that. Um, and now the the uh, I guess the special guest here because we've been trying so hard to get her on. Uh, she's finally here, an actual professional in the in the psychology field. So, um, Robin, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm I'm glad you stuck with me and we finally got you on here. Um, I know you've been listening, so you know, what's your take on what we've been saying? Well, first of all, you have a lot of very very smart people in this space um, who seem to know human behavior pretty well. Um, I think when people first join Twitter. It's like being thrown into a thunderdome and you don't really know what's happening and what's going on. And even for myself, I find myself trying to find the people that I jive with or the people that I can get along with. And I can pretty much get along with anybody outside of people that are abusive. But even myself, I found myself arguing in ways that I typically wouldn't. And so I, I really wasn't active on Twitter until 2019. And I was on for about three months and got off for a month because I didn't like who I became on Twitter, which was very antagonistic and snarky. And I don't mind a little bit of snark here and there, but I was definitely over the top. And so when I rejoined, I said, I'm just going to be me. But I think for the most people, Twitter isn't who they really are. I mean, there are definitely people with personality disorders, cluster B personality disorders, that that is who they are. They are, um, they like to push people's boundaries. They like to... Um, mess with people. They like to get people all worked up or scared. Um, they like a lot of ne- attention, even if it's negative attention. But I think for most people, they're not on Twitter to make relationships. I think that's actually more of a rare thing. And that's what I do now, too. I actually see people I've met on Twitter off of Twitter, like in person or Zoom or whatnot. And I make real relationships. But I don't think that's the average user. I think the average user is here for one of three things either conflict because they enjoy it, like debate, um, politics, um, to actually meet people or for news because Twitter is faster than any other news source. Okay. Um, and that's interesting. Even for yourself, when you first came on, you found that you were changing in, in many ways that you weren't comfortable with. Um, I, I think I can understand that, uh, especially, you know, I'm relatively new to Twitter. Uh, I just started using it in, in August um, and, and figured out pretty quickly that if you feed into the outrage, uh, it'll definitely support it. Um, so you just have to figure out how to navigate around it. Um, but what, what's, let me ask you, just from a professional standpoint, what's like the... What's your number one concern when it comes to people using social media um, and their and their mental state around it? My number one concern, and please, everybody, tell me if this if I'm using lingo, people don't understand. But if you're on Twitter for any amount of time, you probably will. But my number one concern is actually people getting black pilled. Um, it's really easy to find so much negativity on social media. You can truly feel like the world's imploding. Um, especially if you use it for a significant amount of time, 
per day if I don't limit myself to an hour or to a day social media total. If I, I'm doing more than that, I find myself in a more negative frame of mind. And so that's my overall concern is people really feeling despair or depression. Yeah, you know what? That's a really good point. Um, I find, here's kind of like my viewpoint on Twitter. My viewpoint on Twitter is I kind of use it from a distance. Um, I've started looking at it as a tool right? Instead of as like social media, as this thing you just have to get involved in. Um, I, I look at it as a tool and it serves a certain purpose for me. So I'm able to kind of step back and, and take a look and then watch people and watch how people speak, how they react. And you're absolutely right. Uh, if you look at certain accounts, you'll get black pilled real quick. Uh, you know, lives of TikTok is one of those accounts. Where you just think, <laughs> like every teacher is this crazy leftist that, that exists, and like those those people are obviously real people, but you have to step back and look at like what's the totality? Do these people exist? Yes, but is that everywhere? No. Is it probably too many? Probably. Um, you know, is it concerning? Yeah, but how concerning is it? So you you kind of have to put everything in perspective with all the information that you read. Um, you know, you know, the, the video clips, you know, they, they cut out certain parts, you know, that sound crazy. But when you look at the full context, it doesn't sound nearly as crazy as it initially sound. So there's a level of manipulation that happens on here to, to foster that, that black pill uh, and, and keep, you, keep you there. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and I guess one more question I have for you as a professional, and I know technically you're not supposed to diagnose anything from a distance, uh, but is there a particular uh, trend in personality types that you see? That's a really good question. I actually want to piggyback off of what you said earlier, but I'll answer your question first. Um, it's hard to say if people are truly suffering from a personality disorder or if it's some kind of act that they're putting on and that's not who they are in real life. And so you could, I guess, say, well, then they have that personality disorder that's social media only, but we don't really have a mental health framework for that in any kind of diagnostic way. Um, so I do think that there's people that it's really hard to tell, is this just who you are on social media because you're behind a screen and you're at a keyboard and you wouldn't talk to, like, to someone like that in real life. Um, versus somebody that truly is a narcissist or borderline personality disorder. Um, but I, what I see most often is narcissism when I do see it. And I'll just say narcissism. Did I lose you? You saw that, Robin? Jenny, can you, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, there you are. Okay. We lost you for a second. Oh. Um, so I don't know if you heard. I said the most, what I see most often is narcissistic traits when I see any kind of mental health. I do see quite a bit of people struggling with depression or suicide ideation as well. Um, and that might be because, like you, I use my account now after two, three years of using it for very specific things. Um, like building relationships or researching three or four topics in mental health. I follow accounts specifically for those because um, I do a lot of writing around those. So I use it very specifically. So that could be why I'm seeing more of that than other people are, certain mental health things. So that's something to take in consideration too. But the libs of TikTok, I love that you brought that up because I was actually at a training today for teachers and counselors um, and it was an SEL training and it was chock full of critical race theory, queer theory, gender theory. And I was actually shocked about how many people didn't even know what they were being taught in the room. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, and I have, uh, I guess one more question, and I guess you kind of brought up on it, but like uh, the best analogy I can think of is you know, when someone, I don't want to say wins a lot of money, but let's say uh, someone gains a lot of money in a, in a very quick manner, 
right? Mm -hmm. And now they're a rich person and they're kind of an asshole, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the saying is the money didn't make them an asshole. It only just exaggerated how much of an asshole they actually are, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I wonder if social media doesn't necessarily make someone an asshole, it only exaggerates the asshole they actually are. <laughs> well, I think we're I all know. capable of being an asshole. All of us are. And given the right circumstances and the lack of ability to filter ourselves, that will come out. And maybe sometimes it just comes out for some of us as irritable in our re like offline personalities, irritable, or we're snapping at the people we love, or we're super cranky, or... Um, we're just mean or we hit below the belt with someone because we're upset. Like, I think we all have the capability of doing that. I do think social media makes it easier because it's not face to face. So I do think it makes it easier for that side of us to come out. And I do think some people just truly enjoy it, like really enjoy being an asshole. And, you know, we call them trolls, of course, but yes, they're there. And I do think it takes a while to figure out, oh, even if I like debate, that's not a genuine debate. So why am I wasting my time? there and there's all this talk too about like people trying to figure out other people's personalities or like alt accounts and all of that and I think that's its own beast on social media as well because you can create multiple accounts and like you're trying to figure out who is trolling you what their alt accounts are that's real and that becomes its own level of like black pill too of like why do I have to spend time figuring out like why can't I just block someone and be done with that and then there's this whole theory on is blocking okay or is that harsh or whatever like there's so many different personal rules around how people use Twitter that they try to imply on other people I think that's unhealthy too I think people have to use Twitter in the way that's healthiest for them okay um Tickle you wanted to say something I am. Um, thank you. I'm so grateful for Robin being here. Thank you. I am nowhere near a professional or trained to be one. Um, the the biggest, I think, from my experience, um, the biggest grievance that I have was that um, on a particular day of the week and uh, over the weekend, I would primarily host for veterans, PTSD veterans, promotely. Pre pre uh, precisely and and it became extremely successful and no one in there and I would constantly remind people as the host that we had no professionals on board this was just for people to come and and talk and share and support one another connected one another to discuss similarities things of that nature again not in any professional sense whatsoever and and it was very popular and there were even a couple of times where we would hear a lot of emotional language and a lot of a lot of emotions, um, crying, tears, sobbing, while gaining support from others going through similar or the same. And that got broken apart um, by the the I, I just call them the begrudgers. That's my nickname for them, the begrudgers. And and that does grieve me. Um, and even, but even now, I still get some beautiful DMs from these these people that, are, that have gone through so much and still do. And I actually took to using a different account to host for them so we could still do that. But of course, it doesn't get the same amount of um, people joining to do because it has to be done somewhat in secret. Otherwise, it, it just becomes a mess again with with quote-unquote trolls and that's the last thing you need when people want to speak about their troubles and it it does that does i i do find that very egregious actually it, it's the it's the biggest part that that bothers me about the whole event that i experienced i don't take it so much for me because i i'm not I'm not a black pill kind of personality and i joke around that for a redhead i'm i'm rather calm-tempered um, so I, I've never really gone on a big, a big campaign against anyone in 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 fighting back. I just let it, let the, the the waves roll, and that's where they go. And I have my own little expression that I just sat on the riverbank of their misery and watched them float float by. But it does bother me 
um, that something so positive and so productive was almost destroyed because of whatever personality disorders, <clears throat> excuse me, they may be experiencing without knowing it. And I find that that's the most, <clears throat> excuse me, most troubling part of all of this is the the negativity. Um, and Libs of TikTok actually is a, a pretty good friend of mine. She, um, when she first started her account, um, I was one of the first people to connect with her through a story that she had posted. And since then, we have a, a direct message friendship, basically. Um, and she she does actually worry about this. She she is concerned that she has so much negativity on her account that it could be you know impacting more than she wants it to as opposed to you know trying to red pill people um with what's going on she is concerned that there's actually a black pill aspect to this and and the fact that she's conscious of that i think speaks volumes and so you know and i and i do the same thing every now and again i'll you know i mean i, I do a lot of memes a lot of political memes and so you know some people would say that's a black pill moment I'm not sure if it is or whether it's, I try and make it humorous more than anything else. Um, and of course, then we have that those moments where we we put together um, in, intentionally put together aspects of saying, well, you know, timeline cleanse, timeline cleanse, and you put you know cute puppies or horses or something like that, um, just to balance it. And that I find kind of works definitely for me, but I'm not quite sure about the audience per se. It. Um, there is definitely a black pill aspect to people that are not able to balance that for themselves. Um, and then it does put them in, you know, grumpy moods and combative moods. And I think the, the, the combative mood is, is, the, is the most dangerous of all, um, of where people think it's perfectly okay to just, you know, say something absolutely horrendous and just walk away from it. And it's, it reminds me of the alcoholic um, who in their blackout stages gets to say and do absolutely outrageous things and doesn't remember the next day. But the people that were there for the fallout do remember. And they're the ones that have to live with that, not the actual perpetrator of these negative acts. And, and I do equate some of this to that blackout syndrome that, um, that substance abusers go through. And they have no idea the damage that they've done because it's it's not in their consciousness and they have no idea because they just do not remember. Um, and I think that there's something to that too. I'd, I'd love your opinion on that. So that was a lot of wonderful information and there's actually three or four points in there that haven't been talked about, at least as far as I've heard yet. I didn't hear everything everyone said while I was trying to get in. But um, the first of that being people working out their mental health issues on each other. I think this happens offline, but it's a lot slower over a lot more time offline. You know, you meet someone and maybe you go out for coffee and then you just start hanging out and slowly over time, they start to reveal any mental health issues that are there. But online, it's so much faster. Our interactions, um, they might be very short lived and they're just working that out on you in that one moment, or it could be you see them repeatedly. I think there's one guy that's repeatedly in my mentions saying really nasty things all the time. I have him muted at this point, but if I unmute him, he's there every day. Um, and it's just trying to work out his mental health issues on other people. So I don't, I don't think that's that different. Like it does, it does happen offline, but it's just so much faster online. Um, there isn't a relationship built up first um, online before that starts to happen. So I think that's true that that's there. And I do think live of TikTok is a valuable service. Like I think we need to know what is out there um, and what pockets are out there, particularly like for me, finding out that there's a whole group of teens self-diagnosing with um, identity disorders, um, associative identity disorders specifically was really, really alarming. And I don't think the mental health world, like just the average mental health practitioner knows that that's happening. So if you're not made aware of that by something like Libs of TikTok, you, you're not, as a mental health professional, you're not even aware. But I can tell you in my community, very few people are aware, mental health professionals are aware that's actually happening. There's over 500 of us and very few are aware. So I do think that there's a valuable service, but yes, it, you can get black pilled, but so you have to choose how often you engage, right? So like, I don't look at lives 
of TikTok every day. It doesn't show up in my feed every day. Um, I would say two or three times a week I see it and I don't always comment on it. Sometimes I do and sometimes I just take in the information. Um, and I do think whether or not other people find timeline cleanses helpful, I do at least two every day on my account. And I do have some followers that follow just for those. Um, but because they're specific types like photography or a Bible verse or something. And so they follow just for those. But for me, that does ground me that my Twitter account is meant to be for uplifting people and building relationships. And so when you find those pockets, I think it's important to perpetuate those and keep those positive if you can. And if you are putting something positive out and somebody's commenting in a really nasty or negative way, just completely ignoring that, you know? Um, and also making sure that if you're in DMs or groups with people, that the ground rules of those groups are stated up front. You know, like I've been in a few DM groups that were wonderful and the ground rules were stated up front about what was talked about in the group and what was talked about publicly. And I think that builds trust and builds relationships. Those are people I still see off of Twitter now, um, three years later. Um, and I have some people that are my best friends that I met on Twitter because they're real relationships that we really invested in over time, like you would offline. And so I think if you can find those things, if you're an honest person, you will find honest people. But it's just building them slowly like you would build them offline slowly. Um, the last thing I will say about all of that is if you are familiar with someone and you start to see them acting differently, more aggressively or um, more intense, just check on them offline. Whenever I've done that or like DM them, um, it's, it's usually correct that they've been black pilled that day and they just need somebody to reach out to them. So I think that's one way we can help each other in this space is if you start to see someone else acting in a way that's not like their typical self, just DMing them and saying, hey, are you okay? Does that help? Yeah, that's, that's actually great advice. Um, you know, if you have somebody that you care about and you see that they're behaving uh, differently, um, it's, it's always a good idea to, to reach out and see where their head is at. Um, I actually wanted to bring up, because we were on the topic of Lives of TikTok. So I remember when I first uh, started watching Lives of TikTok, and to me, initially, it was like a, it was a funny thing. Uh, and sometimes, you know, depending on what the topic is, a little bit disturbing. But uh, there, I started realizing from like a psychological standpoint, like the ones that I used to kind of laugh at, I actually just started feeling really bad for them. Um, you know, I guess the best way of putting it is, and, and Robin probably knows exactly what I'm talking about. You can look into someone's eyes and tell that they're lonely, right? You can, you can tell like, they don't have anybody. Like they don't, they don't have any real friends, anybody that they can really call on. And what concerns me is, you know, the extreme leftist ideology, um, this is not to be like hyper political or anything like that, but I'm just looking at the aspects of an ideology that is continually fluid, that is surrounded, uh, that's built on having some sort of community, uh, but the community is based on feeling oppressed and being different, being the outcast, um, and and feeling like you know whether it be like the activist kind of feel um, to it, but you know, they kind of build in many ways like a false sense of community. But in reality, it's people who are experiencing some sort of mental anguish or trauma um, and they're all getting together. Um, you know, I talk a lot about feminism. And one of the things that's interesting to me when I really look at a lot of like the feminists, I actually really believe them when they say certain things. Um, and when you listen to them long enough, someone will tell them, some of them will tell you that I've been sexually assaulted and I get it. I get why they're there. But what worries me is that uh, you have an ideology that takes a hold of people who've experienced real trauma and says, uh, the problem is not you. The problem is not just that guy who did that to you. It's all of them. Right. And it builds it, it basically takes advantage of that person's trauma 
and uses it to, to gain a foot soldier for the cause uh, and, and foster that hatred for that singular person that hurt them, or even, you know, let's say it was multiple uh, men that hurt them and turn it into all men. Um, and, I'm, and I'm always very worried about that. I'm worried about ideology and how it takes advantage of people who are experiencing real trauma, um, people who legit need help. And then, you know, in, in, in Robin's profession, now they're, they're trying to reaffirm people, right? Not even questioning their, their thoughts or having them question their thoughts, asking them questions back, right? They're reaffirming their irrationality. And that is highly concerning too. So, you know, there's a strong ideological component here, but um, I, I'm always really worried about the level of loneliness that I see from young people, the level of trauma that I see from people, and they mix it up with ideology and, and they never really truly get help. Yeah, I think you're 100% on point with there being an ideology mixed with either mental health or loneliness. And then there's a whole ideology of victimhood, right? Like, so even if you're not truly experiencing any trauma, you're told that any slight that you feel, any microaggression you feel is trauma. And then they build these entire identities out of trauma. And so it feeds into this ideology. And this happens, I think, like when you see the lib of TikTok, I think there are communities on like Discord or Tumblr that are whole groups of young adults or teens that fit those categories. And then they'll, they'll feel really supported in that little community on Discord or Tumblr. And then they'll make this TikTok thinking that they're going to receive the same kind of feedback there. And it kind of becomes a joke there, which then perpetuates the victim status again. Um, so I'm concerned about that as well, that people that are have been taken advantage of because they've been told their whole lives they're oppressed or, they've been, or they're a white, straight, um, gender conforming person who has been told they're terrible their whole life. And so they want to feel some kind of special in some sort of way. And so they take on a victim identity of some sort so they can stop being told they're an oppressor or uh, an abusive, racist, homophobic, transphobic bigot. Um, so I, yeah, it's, and psychological warfare has a role to play in all of this too. Like I saw it a lot during COVID management um, of how certain messages would get spread. And actually we homeschool our kids. And one of the things we've been doing with them is um, we watched the Rittenhouse trial, pieces of it together. And then we had them read news story titles and tell us whether it was fact or fiction. And if it was fiction, it, I mean, fact, is it fact with manipulation or is it true just here are the facts? No spin, no story created around it, just here are the facts. And my kids were able to do that pretty quickly because they're not on social media. But I think when you're on social media all the time, it gets really hard to tell, wait a minute, is this story trying to make me feel a certain way? For me as a psych, you know, as a therapist, if I see any article or news thing or a politician or a large account um, saying something and I feel really strongly one way or another about it, I have to stop and check, like, is this, am I being manipulated right now? Particularly around fear. Fear and love are the two most easily manipulated emotions. So if I'm feeling fear, am I being manipulated right now or is this truly a threat to me? So it's all of those things combined. It's ideology pushing a fear agenda in order to control people. And if you wanted me to, I can take it way back to like how this all started during the sexual revolution when we stopped equating rights to humanity and started creating rights around identity markers. Um, and um, part of that has to do with, I'm a Christian, but those who wanted theocracy trying to keep rights from homosexuals um, instead of seeing no humanity any adult consenting adult should be able to marry any other consenting adult it has nothing to do with identity but they didn't they fought it and then understandably homosexuals leaned into identity politics to gain their human rights to live freely without oppression and that was the birth of identity rights and now we're in this place where this is becoming now about 
transgender or gender dysphoria. And like you said, affirmation, which affirmation has nothing to do with therapy. No amount of therapy is affirmation. We affirm people's inherent human worth. We do not affirm their choices, their opinions, their beliefs. That is on them to figure out. It's just my job to help them figure out who they think they are, not to tell them who they are, not even to affirm who they are. That is their job. So it, it's gone to that extent as well. And now we have social media pushing this whole, your ideology is who you are, your identity markers are who you are, and they all better include victimhood or you have no social standing. Victimhood is our current currency in society. Sorry, I totally went on a rant there, but you touched something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfectly fine. Can I speak to this for a moment? I, yeah. I love everything that you just said, Robin. Um, and I'm sitting here, as I said, I was I was late getting in. Um, and again, my apologies. But I'm still sitting in my car because I don't want to let go of the phone. Um, it, you're absolutely correct um, about identity politics. And um, you know, as, as a young kid in, in South Africa, I, I saw things that no one should ever see, regardless of age groups. No one should ever witness some of the things that I saw at the, the latter days of, of apartheid. Um, and people, this is where politics becomes a weapon because the majority of Americans don't fully comprehend that apartheid went both ways. And, and that was government controlled as well. And, and this is all part of identity politics now. And the victimhood that everyone feels is, is it's a profit margin unfortunately. And it's all been politicized again since the sexual revolution in the 60s. And, you know, I witnessed it with, with, my, with my own mother, who was a remarkable woman in the 60s and punched through so many glass ceilings. And then I came along when she was considered to be middle-aged. And when I hit 18 and looking at uh, the further education, well, actually 16, where I come from, further education and higher education, she virtually turned around and told so don't bother. Um, it's not going to be worth your while. And, of course, I didn't take that advice and, and pursued what I ended up doing for a living. And I'm glad that I did. But I don't identify with being a victim because it wasn't mine to own. It was done to us in the sense of the divisions um, I am light complected, so visually I look like a white woman. I'm actually, because of my ancestry of Zulu, Hottentot, and Boer, the majority of my family are extremely dark skinned. And so I witnessed that division that was tried to create in my own family and was actually removed from my family for a short while because I was so light skinned and went through horrors because of that. But I don't wear it as a badge. And perhaps that's why I consider myself to be a tolerant person, probably to the extreme of, of people's lives, their issues, whatever they might be. And I don't really like using that phrase, but and whatever their life problems they're, they're suffering from. But I don't wear it as a sense of victimhood. Um, quite the opposite, actually. I. I if I don't wear it per se, but if anything, I see it as, okay, I came through that and I'm better for it and I know how to care and I, I dare to care. And I'm very empathic with some of the stuff that's going on with our children being influenced all over. Um, it never at any time have we seen this, I hate to use the word epidemic, but unfortunately I can't think of much else right now, of, of sexual identity. And one has to question why. Why is this so prevalent in the last few years? Where, where was it all this time? Did we, did we ignore it? Was it not publicized? No, it just wasn't politicized. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that are in this mix don't recognize that they have become political pawns and, and virtual weapons. And, and it, it grieves me that there's few people around them that recognize this on their behalf and say, okay, so you're a five-year-old and you want to be a dinosaur today. Good. Okay. Well, now you're a five-year-old in one day and now you want to be Spider-Man, Superman. That doesn't necessarily equate to having to have sexual surgery or sexual altered surgery. 
And I mean, Texas, of course, it's already hitting the headlines of what Governor Abbott has just recently done. Um, and quite honestly, I, I'm not a big fan of Governor Abbott on an individual basis, but I support this legislation because there's no way that five-year-olds can possibly, can possibly, on, on such a regular basis now, identify as the opposite sex without fully comprehending what that means. Um, you know, I was a tomboy, but I never had any gender reassignment surgery. I was a massive tomboy, but I didn't have gender reassignment surgery. And I'm really glad that my parents didn't even think about that for me. But at the same time, you know, I was the girl that was typical redhead Pippi Longstocking climbing the highest branch on the on the biggest tree where all the boys were still trying to scramble behind me. But that didn't mean that I was eligible for gender reassignment surgery. And I think that, you know, you, you said, yes, um, if, they're, if they're not a victim, then they're not anyone. And we are seeing that increasing, that it's become a badge to wear and, and it, you know, it's up to us as society to bring in oh, some much needed common sense. So well, hold on for a few years. See how you feel about it in a few years. And this is where, you know, where you don't have to, I don't believe you have to be a mental health professional to recognize that. And, and the, but this being the profiteering from this, not just the political profiteering, but, you know, mental health profiteering too of, um, what was his name, Dr. Money, um, down in Australia, who came across twin twin boys in Canada. And one of them was horrendously uh, injured during a circumcision, so much so that um, he actually lost the majority of his penis. And so they did a gender reassignment on him without him knowing until he was about 15. And this, uh, I think his name is David Money, and he decided to monitor these twins throughout their life based on gender reassignment surgery and how it can be successful if it's done early enough to persuade the, the child that they are actually the opposite sex. Unfortunately, both twins ended up committing suicide when they were in their late and early 30s, I believe. And, of course, Dr. Money is now off the radar too. He's since deceased. But it's an interesting case to read what he did with those boys and how the the boy who was altered struggled in his twenties to become a boy, to become a male again, and was and, and even had more surgery to to assist him, but it never ever ever assuaged the mental damage that was done to him. And we, you know those are the cases, and this was in the uh, this was in the sixties. So you know a lot of these things we think are brand new, and they're not necessarily brand new. But the ideology, I find rather disturbing. Right. Um, we're going to go to the uh, audience. Anybody who wants to speak, they can request to speak. Um, I just want to actually go to Ginny real quick because we've kind of skipped over you a little bit. Did you want to add anything before we go to the audience? Oh, I'm just, I'm just happy listening. This is so intriguing. I guess the only thing I wanted to add was I wonder how much the social media plays into – you know, these kids deciding that, because it's not the politics when they're young in my mind. I think that the, you know, grown-ups are taking advantage of kids wanting popularity maybe on social media, and that's why they even think about this in the first place. But it just seems like a lot of people taking advantage of people's vulnerabilities, and that's just what I want to say before we go to the audience. All right. Um, so before I go to the audience, uh, two things. One, um, this episode will be available on a replay and also in like a week, possibly it'll be on YouTube. Uh, so if you go to a goodfaithspace.com, uh, it'll bring you to the YouTube channel. So you can listen to, to this one and also previous episodes uh, with different topics and different panels as well. Uh, so I encourage you to go there, subscribe and uh, give it a listen. Um, before I go to the audience, when I go to you, you know, uh, just to respect everybody's time, try to be clear to the point what you want to state. Uh, so this way we're able to get everybody in uh, and it doesn't take too long. So that's that's my only request. So we will go to Raven Love. Raven Love, you're on the air. I'm sorry. 
Anyway, thank thank you for having me as a speaker. You know, I always love no social problem. media. It's we've always had a older version of it. Society as a whole has always wanted to blend in with one another, no matter what, whether it be the news. Oh, sorry. Anyway, society's always wanted to blend in each other as a whole, whether it be by word of mouth or newspaper or simply, I don't know, like I said, a congregate. It's always been around. And I've seen it. I've never been one to follow trends, so I've often lost interest in just watching social media. Hell, in elementary school, I wanted to be popular. Now, I'm glad I'm indifferent to that. And I see that, like I said, people always want to do something, be recognized for something, because they feel they need a purpose. And now they've gotten so desperate that they'll do anything to have a purpose, whether it be taking someone down who thinks differently than them, or just sacrificing their own family members just to stick to something they've been clinging on but don't want to let go. It's, it's like they, they don't want to believe anything else. It's kind of sad. No, I agree with you. Uh, does anybody on the panel want to comment to what you said? Robin? Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, we all, human nature naturally is to be tribal and to try to find people that we fit in with and we relate to. And when we're offline, a lot of that is visual. And part of it is what you said, Adam, like what you see in people's eyes or in their faces. And other part of it is who looks like me, who talks like me, who acts like me down to accents or um, regional. You know, like my family is a kind of a mutt of European, but German is what I probably look the most like. And so, you know, other even down to that level, we kind of are naturally tribal. And so online, I think people do want to fit in and find the people they mesh with. And I think people can adopt different behaviors or even, so one of the accounts I love a lot, and she's now a friend of mine. Um, when I first started following her, I was seeing her tweets every day and I noticed I was using different words, not a major change, but like one specific word that wasn't, it was in my vocabulary, but I didn't use that often. And I just kind of, and I think we do that. I think we take on mannerisms or language of other people. And so, yeah, I think that's probably some of the trend we're seeing on Twitter is people that are just mirroring each other as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, it's, it's interesting too, because you see, I keep, we always keep going to like the, the leftists, but like they use certain words. And I, when I see certain words, I immediately know who they are. Like, it's almost like, a, it's like an indicator of which tribe they're in. Um, so like, people who use words like problematic. I swear, four or five years ago, barely anybody used that word. Now it's like a commonplace word, but it's commonplace by a particular tribe. Uh, white supremacy, you know, that wasn't something that people use frequently. It, it existed, but it's not something people use. So there's like these different, different language, different signs that you could tell which tribe they're part of. It's definitely interesting when you actually watch how people move. I see that some on the right as well, um, because I work in certain circles. So I talk about abortion quite frequently on Twitter. And so when I talk about my abortion, even though I am now politically pro-life, on the right, I will see people saying terrible things to me or if I talk about single mothers, I will see people, some, especially men of a certain faith, um, talking about single mothers terribly. So there is some commonality on both left and right. Um, but I will say on the right, it's much more long term. Like those are ingrained ideologies that have been around for a long time and they haven't adapted to new language. I think the left, the language changes all the time, which is kind of built into the ideology, right? Like the rules change all the time because they need, nobody can ever be on solid ground when it's a constant hierarchy of victimhood. The rules have to always change. 
So I think that's just kind of built in. I don't know if it was intended that way, but it's built in. I agree with you. Um, we'll go to the next person, Gabs. Hey, y'all. Um, well, uh, I, um, as y'all know, um, I have been dealing with this whole situation for quite some time. And um, I don't know uh, if, if, if everyone knows, I mean, I know I, most people know that um, I'm fi I filed the first lawsuit against critical race theory in the nation, but um, it didn't start with that. Um, I found out about that situation with my son because of what happened with my daughter. Uh, and what was happening with my daughter is what we're talking about right now. So, all of these things that y'all are discussing right now was stuff that was happening and is continuing to happen to my daughter. Um, I've actually had to step down from no left turn in education so that I could pay more attention to what was going on with my daughter so that I could be here for more for my daughter. Because as of right now, she is completely indoctrinated and she thinks she is a boy. So we're, we had been unable to keep that aspect of social media and indoctrination and um, this cult out of my daughter's head. And I can tell you it started from TikTok. Um, and it, this was something that I would not have known had the, had the pandemic not happened. Um, it started from TikTok and it wasn't anything that was being politicized. This is very much something that was happening covertly. It was it was starting from TikTok and then it was being um, reaffirmed with her school. And and not only was it being reaffirmed with her school, but it was it was kind of like like a an aspect of the curriculum. So it was being, it was, I, I, I don't know any other way to articulate it other than to say that they were indoctrinated with it. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just my daughter. It was William as well. I mean, you, y'all, when we talk about these kinds of things, I, and I'm reluctant to say these kinds of things publicly because, you know, we're in an active lawsuit. But at this point, I kind of don't give a shit. You know, the this stuff is so disgusting and so pervasive. You know, it wasn't just it wasn't just the race stuff. It wasn't just the. um it wasn't just the uh, CRT, okay? You know, my son, for the longest time, said that he was asexual because he, he had to say something because he couldn't be just a regular boy because then there's something wrong with you if you're just a regular man, if you're just a regular straight man. And then after a while, when he started to get older, and he started to really start to think for himself, then he was able to say no. My daughter has not reached that point yet, but she is getting there. You need to pull your kids back from this nonsense. You need to get them off TikTok. You need to get them off Tumblr. Like Helen will tell you that. You know, I don't follow libs of TikTok because I can't have that in my brain every day. I will, I will lose my mind. I barely have a mind already. Cause, because see, I'm not, uh, I'm not Candace Owens. I won't turn the other cheek. I was a violent motherfucker, right? So, you know, I, I'm not always, uh, you know, I'm from Houston, Texas. It's not always gentle over here, right? So I can't see lives a TikTok on a regular. Okay, and yes, I have to cleanse my feed. You'll see kitty cats on a regular, you know, me and my kitty cats regularly because I have to do that. 
And I, I've been watching this stuff happen to my friends, to the people who have helped me over this time. The bread pilling, turning to the black pilling, turning to almost what you would consider some sort of psychosis because they can't differentiate reality from, from fantasy, even as they're talking about it. This, is, this is, is the most sinister thing I've ever seen. Were it not for my absolute and ridiculous disbelief in anything um, supernatural or, or anything non-tangible, I don't think that I would be able to differentiate it either. But my, my steadfast common sense prevents me from, from, from being lifted off the ground with this. And it keeps my feet firmly planted. These things are unbelievably toxic. And I, I think that one of the, one of the, one of the things that we don't see enough is regular old people who don't, who don't even own a computer in their home or regular people who, whose children do not have phones talking about how regular their lives are and about how unaffected they are by this nonsense. We don't hear from those people enough because their lives are good. Their lives are usually happy. And generally, um, they got problems like, you know, uh, it rained today. That's their general problem. You know, they don't have problems like, oh, my God, Tiffany said something negative to me on, tw on Twitter. And to go to all of that nonsense, you know, all this folder all about some, some, uh, you know, who fails or whatever, you know, that's childish nonsense. We talk. Grown-ups too. We need more real life. This from now. otherwise, all of this here is going to ruin our entire society, and we let it happen. All right. Um, thank you, Gabs, for for speaking. Um, does anybody? She said a lot. Anybody want to comment? I actually do. Can you cut me off though, if my audio is going in and out? Um, sure. Okay. Thanks. I can't tell if it's on my end, but other people's audio is going in and out. So, Gabs, I just want you to hear me say, you are one hundred percent correct. And I want to give everybody, it's going to black pill y'all a little bit, but everybody a little bit of history around this. So the sexualization of our children has been going on for many, many years. And it started beginning with people who, as adults, were looking back upon their childhood and thinking that when I did this at age two or I did this at age three, that was a sign that I was this sexuality or this gender. But what they don't understand is when you were two or three, you do not have any awareness of any of that. There's this thing called synaptic pruning where you gain more and more knowledge about something that's already in your world. So really quickly, a two-year-old knows that a car moves on wheels. A three-year-old knows that you have to open doors to a car. A four-year-old knows you have to put gas in a car. That is synaptic pruning. It's a car, they, it's something they already know about, but they gain more knowledge. Children are not sexual until minimum puberty. And so we have started sexualizing our children first with you have to tell us what your sexual identity is. Well, their sexual identity is who they are sexually attracted to. How does a child before puberty have a sexual identity? They do not, but now it's being taught in schools that we have to do that. So that's where it begins. And then it's now your gender. We have to know by age two what your gender is because heaven forbid you go through a healthy, normal biological puberty 
and then have discomfort later on. We have this weird fascination with victimhood and suffering, yet we can't stand suffering. We want to pill it away or surgery it away, emotional suffering. So we claim it as this identity, this victimhood of suffering, but at the same time, we want to turn around and have it taken away from us. We can't stand to be in any kind of discomfort. So that's all built into that. And on top of that, now we have this, because rights are now based on identity, we have pedophilia, they're trying to make it a sexual orientation. And I have to tell you, because they are moving mental health into schools and they are putting counselors into schools, you are going to end up, if pedophilia becomes a sexual orientation, it is protected by the Supreme Court in both housing and jobs. And so you will have pedophilias working as counselors in the schools that where children are already being sexualized based on sexual identity and gender politics. And then you add on top of that, if it becomes a sexual orientation, mental health providers who have no conscious protection have to affirm it. So now we have children identifying as pedophiles and counselors and teachers and have to affirm it. Yep, that's what you are and it's totally normal. So this is all an end game that we do not want to go down. And if people do not wake up to what is actually happening, and part of the problem is empathy is being weaponized. You know, if you're set, if you say, I have tremendous empathy actually for pedophiles. I've worked with pedophiles in my profession. I'm also a survivor. I was molested as a child, but I have great empathy for pedophiles. It's a terrible, horrible thing to have happen in your life. It's a terrible, horrible thing to have an attraction that both makes you sick and you can never act out upon. It is terrible. However, my empathy ends when you tell me it should be, you should be allowed to sexualize children. No, not in print and not in real life. Absolutely not. So this is where we see it headed. Let us just create this graphic novels. They're not real children anyway. Well, that's society normalizing the sexualization of children. You cannot take that back once you open that Pandora's box. And this is where all this is heading. Gabs, you are 100% right. With my own children, my 14-year-old is only allowed on Pinterest. And you better believe I take her phone randomly and check every single message and phone call on it. Nobody is allowed any other social media. They're not even allowed to watch YouTube without me in the room. I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 8-year-old, and a 5-year-old. They cannot even watch YouTube without me in the room because now we have Minecraft videos being sexualized. We have My Little Pony being sexualized. This nonstop sexualization of our children. And I think, number one, it's because adults want to feel affirmed in their sexuality. So if they say children have it, how dare we tell a child they can't have that? They're using children as their shields. And on top of that, we have people that want to sexualize children for their own pleasure. So done with my rant, but Gabby, you're on point. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. This was kind of a black pill. Um, but I, I've uttered the similar, um, similar type of things. It's, it's a huge concern. Uh, I joked, I think the, the last space, the space before that, it feels like every space, no matter what the topic is, we always come back to this uh, pedophilia um, and the sexualization of children, no matter what the topic is, because it's a huge concern for a lot of people, especially on here. We see where this is heading. Um, you know, that slippery slope, uh, you know, it used to sound kind of far-fetched, but like we see where this is going. It seems to be happening more and more. You know, why are these people so excited to sexualize children and why are they so upset when we stop them? You know, that that's the part that's disturbing. Um, well, it's with, beyond yeah. that, sorry, Adam, it's good to the point where I have friends who are homosexual who are convinced that it, they was, it was not innate in them. They were homosexual due to trauma or epigenetics in their life, but they can't even, they as homosexuals cannot even openly talk about that because that's threatened to people who feel they were homosexual from birth. So why can't it be both? Why can't some people have innate sexuality and other people it's more of a journey? For some reason, if it's a journey for you, it's a threat for somebody else. So it's not just children. This is, nobody is allowed to talk against the narrative. And the narrative is increased amounts of sexualization of children and violence. Like kink, kink is fine, but it doesn't have to be violent. I don't know why all of a sudden kink is this, we have, like in my opinion, and I, this is somewhat controversial, like sadomasochism and BSDM is actually mental illness being worked out on each other. 
wanting to harm someone else or yourself is not a natural human trait. That is some kind of mental condition you're working out on each other. Now, to consenting adults, I don't think it should be illegal. You can do that all you want, but don't tell me that it's healthy. So this empathy has been weaponized. We're not allowed to call things that are unhealthy, unhealthy anymore, even for adults, more or less kids. No, you're right. You're right with everything you just said there. Or at least I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, we'll go to the next person, uh, Pomology. Uh, did they disappear? Oh, there you are. <laughs> How are you doing? I, I'm doing quite well, thank you. Um, I, I've been listening to this for the last little bit. I didn't get to hear the, the beginning part, but um, uh, for, for your listeners who don't know me, because you kind of need to know where I'm coming from, uh, I am coming to you after a decade in what they call the net route. And I do remember distinctly somewhere around 2012, I have not actually tracked it down yet, but... Um, Netroots Nation actually held a panel on emerging sexuality. I remember seeing it on the program and I didn't go to Netroots Nation that year, so I didn't attend or I, I, I don't know that I would have wanted to attend, but now me, I would have wanted to attend. I wish I had a time machine I'd go back because I think something happened there. I'm not sure. I do know that in 2018, and I've written about it before, I was at a panel at Netroots Nation uh, where I was told that pronouns were the thing that were going to save abortion rights in America. We didn't have to wonder, worry about Roe v. Wade, you see. We need to use the right pronouns, and that would somehow preserve reproductive freedom in America because I don't know. There was a big, tall, you know, trans woman there to tell me, you know, this was African-American saying, you know, Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman? And I'm like, hmm, I got up and walked out. And that's amazing. If you know anything about me, uh, if you've seen the HBO documentary that I'm in about electing Democrats in Alabama, yeah, um, <laughs> that's amazing. So um, I come to you from across no man's land. And uh, I talking about mental health, first of all, since I've been for years in these trenches without any therapy or anything, I can tell you that number one is music. If you haven't taken a music break today, then what the hell is wrong with you? Get some music. Listen to some music. Start finding the song that always makes you happy. For me, you know, it's the talking heads, um, same as it ever was. Yeah, that lyric just always captures me. It makes me happy. Uh, if I'm having a bad day, turn it on. Get to your music. I have a music-driven life because of Twitter. The other thing I want to say is that you want to have an image next to my system at home. I'm not actually at home right now, but next to my system at home, next to the screen, there is, uh, I got this at auction. It's so cool. It from the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's an autographed photo by Kevin McCarthy and Dana Winter of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And I keep that right there because every day on Twitter, I'm going to encounter some Invasion of the Body Snatchers stuff. And I'm going to be like, mm -hmm. the Body Snatchers are out there. They're taking over the minds. The pod people are out there. So, um, you know, stay strong. This is a war. Um, and I say this also as an atheist, right? We're dealing with a cult of Moloch, and I don't mean the literal cult of Moloch. No, it's not some sort of science fiction-y plot where, you know, some people from in the past have survived to the future. No. Although if you want to make that a movie, I will help you with the script. We will add historicity. No, I'm talking about sort of what you want to call the spirit of Moloch, the idea that if we sacrifice the bodies of children, that some good thing will happen, that if we just, you know, smash the body cage of the child, that the gender goblin will emerge. 
you know, uh, and I'm done with it. I'm absolutely done with it. I watch Jazz Jennings and I say, how can you people let this go on? I know what I'm seeing. Don't gaslight. I see what I'm seeing. I've written to newspapers. I've let my thoughts be known. And, you know, I have this one single question that I intend to ask any Democrat that I speak to, any Democratic office holder running for re-election or hopeful running for election. Same question is, you know, what do you intend to do about this? Are you going to follow the lead of Greg Abbott? Oh, my God, I can't believe that I said that. Oh, my God, I, I can't believe I said that. Are you going to follow Greg Abbott's lead and stop the sterilization of the kids or are you going to give me some woke nonsense? And with that, I will be a good progressive. I will turn over the speaking feather. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, does anybody want to uh, make a comment on what he was saying? Okay. I just want to say I love my progressive friends and I love my liberal friends and I love my conservative friends and I love my pro-choice friends, even though I'm pro-life, because I think that what matters most is conversation, not conformity. And so I just want to tell you, while we may be opposite on some of the things we think about, I think having the conversation is more important. And I will say, I agree with you that there's a spirit of Moloch. To me, it's a spirit of sacrificing children for the sanity of adults or what adults think is their sanity. It's not truly sanity, but that's what they think. It's the sacrifice of children for that. And I think, like, even with the abortion debate, we have to acknowledge what there is a loss there, whether or not it should be legal aside. Like, whether that's, a, we have to acknowledge that there's two humans and their rights are competing, right? And I think a case can be made that does a woman have a right to her bodily autonomy in that case? And a case could be made, does the unborn human have a right to life? And like, that's the actual true debate. All of the dehumanize, dehumanization that happens around it from both sides is the beginning of the dehumanization of children and of women. And that just carries on through all of these other topics that we're seeing. And all of it goes back to fear-based psychological warfare. So while we may not agree on everything, I'm with you in spirit, and I appreciate your comments. All right. Um, you know, we're nearing the, the end of this great conversation. It was a little bit chaotic in the beginning, but uh, I think it, it really turned out well towards the, the middle, and, and now we're at the end. Um, we'll go with final thoughts. We'll start with Ginny. Ginny um, what do you think? I think there's just a lot going on here. I've really enjoyed this conversation, but I do think that, um, I don't remember who it was, I think it was Gabs was talking about how social media, you know, really watch your kids. I think really pay attention to what your kids are doing online because there are vultures out here willing and ready to take full advantage of your kids for political reasons. We see that. We know how politicized our country is right now. So just pay attention to that, I think, is the most important thing. It, you're right, Adam, I listen to all your conversations that we do on here, and pedophilia always comes up because it's so, it's so prevalent what they're doing to sexualize the kids, and I think, you know, if nothing else, everybody should be able to come together against that. So really pay attention to that as my final thoughts, and, and be aware of what your kids are doing online, or get them off. They don't need to be on there. Um, you know, just get them off. I agree. Uh, tickle. I, I can't disagree with anything that I've just heard in the last several minutes at all. I'm familiar with uh, Gab's story, and she and I have spoken before, and she's a remarkably strong woman. Um, please show her your support, um, even if it's just with a, a follow. She, uh, she has a, an incredible story to share, and uh, I wish her nothing but success in, uh, in overcoming all of this. It, it is a moment, um, you know, social media bullying comes in all forms. It comes in all sorts of different forms, whether it's um, direct or indirect. And what we see our children going through is also a form of bullying. Um, but it's a bullying in reverse. They're, you know, those that don't agree with them are being bullied. And those that don't agree with the um, manifesto are being bullied and it is a manifesto and I, I've said many times over and I was so thrilled to hear it from Robin 
we we are by human nature we collect in pods we are the, we're tribal we're very tribal we've always been tribal always from the very get go and and just to you know bring that into basic terms of saying you know when when you were in school you you know either you know hung out with the jocks that's tribal you hung out with the the kids in the band that's tribal you hang out with the chess club kids the math kids whatever it happened to be the kids with red hair like myself that's tribal we've always been tribal and whether it it's from a viewpoint of tribal based on our religious beliefs or whether it's based on our political beliefs or or anything at all whether we we only like white american cheese versus yellow american cheese it doesn't really i mean it it can be that ridiculous sometimes and debates on those i've i've witnessed um and so we have to recognize that our global governments realize there was profit in in our natural instincts of tribalism and this is where we've we've now um become bullied because of it and if we don't agree with edicts that are thrown at us then we're bad people if we don't agree with that particular tribe but yet when you talk to that tribe there's no big deal no one's got any big fight with each other the fights are being orchestrated um and no different from the actors in sorry people but wrestling um you know it, it's orchestrated to divide and again politicize for profitable gains and i do mean money i, I don't necessarily just mean popularity but i do mean money and if you take a look into the history of some of these quote unquote bullies uh, as to where they got their beginnings from and and you'll find that um and, I, and in no way am, am I alluding to gays being pedophiles but the person that designed the gay flag was actually the leader of NAMBLA the the man boy North American man boy love association and you have to recognize the origins of these things and not just in the recent years of saying well we if you don't agree with a kid having a sex change you are you know anti blah 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 no realize and recognize the history um and again if you want to look at uh, dr money and that was his real name money um you'll find that there's an abhorrent story of the origins of sexual mutilation in children and that's what this is and how you know to try and overcome um a, a medical accident a surgical accident and therefore what has become of that and it all has got the foundation on him this whole entire event goes back to him and if we, if we you know what what is it what's that expression if we don't recognize this we're doomed to repeat it um and to just you know be advised and 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 don't always take the headlines for being accurate all right thank you tickle and by the way you just lost 100 followers for saying that wrestling isn't real so <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go to Robin. Uh, what's your what's your final take? So my final take is make sure you know what's happening to your children in the schools. Make sure you never sign anything without fully reading through what the contact is, or contract is, particularly around mental health. I personally would encourage you to pull your kids out of the schools. Um, and if you need help doing that, DM me and I will talk to you about how to do that. Um, I know every state is different, but I will work with you and your state to figure out your laws and help you do that. Um, but if your kids have to stay in school because homeschooling is not a possibility for everybody, make sure you read through every word of everything you sign and refuse to sign things that you do not agree with. They cannot die, deny your children education just because you refuse to sign something saying they can treat your child for mental health, number one. Number two, pay attention to the tribes your children are building. Their relationships, their friendships, those are their tribes. In our house, we try to build tribes around certain character traits. The character trait of goodwill, the character trait of assuming the best of other people until proven otherwise, the character trait of cautious optimism. So try to build your tribes and then help your children build their tribes around the type of characters 
that they want to have in their life or characteristics they want to have in their life. Um, I always encourage people to have that one friend that you go to that you can cry to and they're just going to comfort you. The one friend that generally agrees with you and the one friend that's going to tell you every time you're wrong because you need all perspectives. So making sure you have lots of perspectives in your life um, is another one that I think is really important. And like Tickle said, make sure you're just checking yourself. Where are you being manipulated? And um, one thing she said, I will say, historically, the, um, the rights of gay people have been used by nefarious characters to try to push their agendas. So we just have to be really careful how we interact um, with that community and how we support that community. If anybody in this room is in that community, I just want you to know, I see you, you are valid and I do not believe that you want your rights to be used to harm children, That it, like that's happening. So we have to support each other, even if we don't ideologically agree on everything or politically agree on everything, freedom has to come first and we have to honor each other in every way we possibly can. And that's my last word. All right, thank you, Robin. Um, I guess my final words from the, the perspective as a, as a parent, uh, and I have a 16 year old, um, I always educated my son as to what social media is, um, what to expect on it, uh, and also to kind of downplay the importance of it. Um, so, you know, my son uses Snapchat, uh, but that's the only social media he really uses. Um, but he's very aware as to what it is. And we talk about, you know, psychology a bit. Uh, but I guess ultimately what I'm getting at is have conversations with your kids, right? Uh, you know, fortunately, I'm technically inclined and I'm very aware of, uh, you know, the world around me and, and the culture wars and all these things. So I can have these conversations with my son and I've been having these conversations. So when something strange happens in school, he brings it to me and we have a discussion. I might go to his, his principal. I've done that a couple of times, right? So you have to have an open dialogue with your kids. You have to prepare them and let them know what kind of things may show up. Uh, if this shows up, you need to let me know. Um, here's what this means. You know, all of these different things. You have to have an open dialogue with your kids um, because at some point they're going to get on social media whether we like it or not. At some point, they're not going to be around you. Uh, they're going to use their phone for whatever. They're going to be at a friend's house. Uh, you know, they're going to sleep over somewhere and they play a game and you won't know. And so this is why you have to prepare your kids for the real world in an age appropriate way. Um, I think that's extremely important that, you know, conversation, dialogue with your kids and being honest with them but like I said, everything comes from the perspective of it, of it being age appropriate. What I see a lot of is uh, not being age appropriate with conversations. And, and that's where my, my gripe with a lot of the sexual conversations with very young children who, fully, who don't fully understand what is being told to them. Um, you know, because social media is a way for kids to take on bad behavioral traits that look cool uh, or bad ideologies that basically persuade them to, to take on these behavioral traits, to adapt to uh, tribes, like, uh, as you, were, you guys were saying before, adapt to tribes that are unhealthy, that are imbalanced, and you want your kids to be balanced throughout their life. Um, you know, you have all these different influences today that didn't exist when I was a kid. Right. Uh, you know, the Internet in its infancy was kind of the Wild West, but at the same time, it, it wasn't as uh, curated, I guess that's the best way of putting it, curated as it is today with all these different algorithms, uh, billion dollar interests and the play on outrage. Um, oh, that's Alexa. <laughs> uh, but, all the, you know, the play on outrage and everything. So. I think it's extremely important that we, we stay aware of what social media is. Social media should be a tool. You have to figure out what that tool is supposed to do for you. Uh, is it something where you're, it's going to build up yourself? 
Is it something where you gain some followers to have some sort of influence for a particular person to make money, whatever it may be, but you need to understand what that tool is uh, for you personally and don't deviate from it. Don't get caught up in the outreach. Don't get caught up in all these different things because ultimately it can change you. It can alter who you are. It can pull out something um, that you isn't pleasant, uh, you know, just, just as Robin had described earlier. And she didn't feel comfortable acting in that particular way. And I think in a very short period of time for myself, I felt that way. And I had to re-examine, am I being manipulated? You know, why is this coming up? Should I even react to this? Um, and one last thing, a big tip, schedule your tweets. Um, if you have something truly on your mind, schedule your tweets and kind of disconnect from it and see where it goes. You know, if you choose to engage with people, engage with them until it becomes a bad faith situation. Um, don't get into arguments with people. All of these things will affect your mental health. Um, because no matter what, no matter how much I could say, I don't care how people think or what they think about me, when I engage with them, I'm putting some sort of emotion attachment to it. So you have to find a way or find at what moment do you pull away? Because your sanity is far more worth it than winning some stupid argument with a stranger on the internet. So um, I think we just have to be wiser as adults when it comes to social media. And if we can do that, I think we can start to, to uh, utilize social media the best way we can that advocates for a healthier and more positive uh, tool, essentially, for all of us. So I don't know. That's my, that's my final take. Um, I want to thank again Jenny, Tickle, and Robin uh, for coming on here. Thank you, ladies. So it's always a pleasure. You do a fantastic job of hosting. You've always got great topics and great people. And I'm always very honored and very flattered. And thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you. Uh, and Jenny, thank you for coming in last minute. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. And uh, Robin, thank you again for your expertise. You know, it's always good to hear a professional's viewpoint uh, when it comes to psychology. So I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you inviting me on, and I appreciate that people will trust that there are therapists out there that aren't woke. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and, and one last thing, uh, if anybody wants to listen to this episode and previous episodes, um, you can go to a goodfaithspace.com. That'll bring you to the YouTube channel and just subscribe to it. You can take a listen to previous spaces that we've done, different topics, different panel. Uh, Tickle's been on a couple of them. She's starting to become a regular. So, um, you know, give them a listen, subscribe to the channel. I appreciate that. Other than that, everybody have a wonderful night. Thank you for listening. Sorry for the, uh, the chaos in the beginning, but it was well worth it. So uh, have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thanks again, panel.